Welcome to the Market Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Stalter. And in this show, we cut through the noise and give you real market insights from professional investors, traders, asset managers, and analysts. Our guests put the market developments in context and give you actionable information to make you a more successful trader or investor. Let's get started. You know, there's really only one thing investors want to know right now, and that's how to handle the current uncertainty and, of course, get opportunity in this uncertainty. Now, as I'm recording this, the S&P 500 is trading to the downside, approaching its May 12th low of 38.58, but still not quite undercutting that yet. And this action follows last week's little bounce in the market, which as I've been warning, was not the start of a trend. And we can see that clearly now. All of this brings me back to my days running a registered investment advisory firm where I had a fiduciary duty to my clients. I've been out of that business for a couple years now. And as with most things, I have a better perspective now that I've stepped back. And it's clear to me, many in the advisory industry simply tell clients to stay the course even if it means incurring some opportunity cost in a bear market. Now, for a lot of advisors, and I'm really familiar with that industry, by the way, not only is there zero interest in making tactical adjustments, but there's even campaigning against it. And there are reasons for that, including the fund companies encouraging people to remain fully invested at all times, as well as a desire from advisors to discourage a lot of trading. And don't forget, there's money to be made from the industry on both of those positions. But on the other hand, I do understand some of the caution against active trading because it can become reactive and willy-nilly if advisors and their clients are not careful and deliberate. And that backdrop is why I was so happy with today's interview with asset manager Brad Conger. Brad discusses his approach to asset allocation with an eye toward maintaining your investment philosophy in the current market but also adjusting your holdings accordingly to what's currently showing strength and weakness. He particularly addresses the fixed income side, which frankly gets overlooked as most investors focus on equities. And I get that too, because equities are more exciting, they're easier to understand, they get a ton more media coverage, and they deliver higher returns. So with all of that in mind, listen closely to this interview today. It's much more of a 30,000 foot view than a trading manual. And you know what? Even if you are a shorter term trader or even a swing trader, my view is you need to get this bigger picture. So listen closely today. You will get a very thorough perspective on the current market. And as a bonus, Brad shares where he sees potential as a contrarian investor. And yes, I am talking about the equity side now. It's a little different from what you are probably hearing elsewhere. So you don't want to miss that. Here's my interview with Brad Conger of Hurdle Callahan. All right, Brad, thank you so much for joining the show today. I wanted to just get right to the point of what everybody is thinking about when it comes to the market these days. So many uncertainties. I mean, we've got inflation. We've got doubts about the Fed. We've got Russia, Ukraine. We've got supply chain. I mean, as I'm speaking today here, there's a baby formula shortage. I mean, there are so many things that are making people nervous right now. How should retail investors, maybe those without an advisor or maybe those who manage part of their own portfolio, how should they be positioning their portfolios in light of everything going on right now? Great question. I think the first thing to say, Kate, is that whatever uncertainties you can read about in the newspaper, like supply chain or the response of the Federal Reserve and in raising interest rates, that is reflected in the prices that you pay for all securities. And so, you know, the price you pay for Microsoft today reflects, you know, the uncertainties around, you know, COVID in China, for example, or increases in interest rates. So in a way, the simplest thing is to say it's already discounted and 
if your portfolio objectives are consistent with a certain allocation to equities, I don't think retail investors really need to worry. And the second thing is to really point out that nobody knows how these things are going to resolve themselves. And it is easy to see the downside. And But I think that people sometimes underestimate how much downside is discounted. And if any of these things eventuate better than what we think right now, stocks can move positively and catch people off guard. So I think the my answer would be there is certainly no need to overreact if you have the right asset allocation for your circumstances. And I'm well familiar with the efficient market hypothesis and broad asset allocation. Isn't that tough, though, for actual investors and traders, kind of where the rubber meets the road, where they're hearing the crazy things going on in the news today? Isn't it kind of an emotional discipline exercise to really stick to your investment plan in light of all this? I think it really is. And one thing I always keep in mind is when we're going through a difficult patch is to recognize that this is precisely why equities have a long-term excess return, because you have to stomach the uncertain environments where they go down. In other words, if they were always going up, they didn't react to uncertainty in the world, then you wouldn't get compensated for them in the long term. So I think sort of, I know it does, it sounds a little facile, but I think, you know, keeping in mind that what these are precisely the periods that make equities attractive for the long run. It's very true. And I can recall March 2009, actually, and perhaps you do as well. Yes, I do too. I was alive. Yeah. <laughs> and how many investors did not believe what was actually going on for well over a year? I can remember talking to people well into 2010. And they still did not believe the rally was real. So I think there's a lot of this kind of ongoing denial that maybe these type of bear markets create in people. Have you seen that? Yes. I think I can remember even into 11 and 12, because even after the U.S. had come out of that crisis or was sort of past the worst of it, we had the crisis in the Eurozone in the summer of, of 2011 we had, you know, the treasury refinancing crisis around the same time. So no, it's, you know, markets are sometimes slow to price in turns. And I think that the good news is that, and one thing that, you know, that I've been focusing on is that earnings for corporate America have actually been really strong and really resilient through all of the you know, supply chain issues that we had, the labor cost increases last year. And so if I asked, you know, 100 people whether they thought S&P earnings as of today for the end of the year were up or down versus January 1, I'll bet you 80% of the people would say they're down. And in point of fact, they're up 5%. And so that tells you that, you know, the fundamental backdrop is pretty good, despite all of the bad headlines. Well, let me pause on that for a second, because I, I agree with you, and I track the earnings as well as they come out. But, you know, what happens, I think, is the news is quick to jump onto a big debacle. So Netflix, for example. Yes. Right, is one that comes to mind. And the headlines I saw this morning concerned Walmart saying that inflation is starting to creep in and affect its customer base. I mean, it seems that these are the kind of headlines that we see that discourage people. That's exactly right. And we have to remind our clients all the time that, you know, the companies that have accidents in their quarterly reports are the ones that get all the headlines in the Wall Street Journal. And Netflix is a perfect example. Whereas, 90% of US companies in or S&P companies in the first quarter actually reported better than expected 
numbers. Um, it so happens that the disappointments get all of the attention. I don't mean that you shouldn't pay attention to those because especially something like Walmart is definitely a straw in the wind. You know, when they say their customers feeling decreased real disposable income, that's something we all need. To, and, you know, Netflix has 200 odd million subscribers. And so if those people are pushing back on price increases, I don't think we should ignore them. But I don't think, you know, at the end of the day, they should overwhelm the decision about, you know, whether to be. Yeah. Let me ask you the psychological question about that, then, is how do investors actually do that? kind of keep this all in balance and be realistic about what to expect, but not panic when they see these headlines. And we all know, by the way, as a side note, we know what the news is designed to do. It's designed to bring you the bad information and drive clicks. But that's hard for people to keep in mind. So one thing that I always find helpful is to think about, you know, what do we really expect equities to do? And, you know, everybody has a number in the back of their head about what they want out of equities. But I think something, a realistic number would be, you know, somewhere between five and 8%. It might be, you know, maybe seven and a half now because we've gone down. But, and if you look over longer time frames, you know, the past 10 years, the S&P has delivered 16, all right, compounded annually. So if we go through a couple of bad years, that still, you know, keeps people in line with a long-term expectation for what equities should do. That's one way to, to sort of, uh, sort of hold confidence in the longer term. And I know for a lot of people who are either traders or maybe do not understand the historic annualized returns, you know, if you say something like five to eight percent that can just sound ridiculously low. And as you pointed out- it Sounds horrible. <laughs> it's, that's right. Especially in light of even what the S&P has done in recent years, right? Yeah. But, you know, when interest rates are, you know, the real 10-year rate is negative, you know, a, a seven is really about all you can ask for, I think. And maybe, you know, the past 10 years, number one, we're, you know, coming off it started with, like you pointed out, depressed sentiment. And number two, we had a very strong tailwind in the form of falling rates and you know, globalization. And so maybe we pulled forward returns. And so it's probably a good idea to you know remind ourselves that equities don't do 16 you know, forever. <laughs> They tend not to do that. Right. And you know, it's interesting. I want to bring in some of my own experience. I mentioned to you that I did own a registered investment advisory firm for several years. And I've had many, many conversations with clients. And when you do tell them this 5 to 8%, they first they kind of look at you. But then when you do extrapolate that out throughout their financial plan, throughout their lifetimes, it starts to make a lot more sense when it's in that context, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's a doubling in 10 years. Right. And that can really produce a retirement nest egg, you know, if it's adhered to. It's like the worst thing you can do is have an aggressive investment plan. I know you know this, but, you know, have an aggressive investment plan and maybe one that's more aggressive than you could tolerate and then change horses in the middle of the stream. And, you know, you basically get the worst of both worlds. You actually realize the downside volatility of equities and never get to enjoy the actual upside. I want to talk a little bit with you, Brad, about asset allocation, but we're kind of leading into another question I wanted to ask you about, which is tactical. We can come back to strategic in just a minute, how to achieve that. Tell me your thoughts on tactical allocation. And for the listeners, just in a nutshell, what that kind of means is more frequent trading in response to market conditions, not necessarily panic trading. I don't want to say that because it's not but just more frequent trading to try to maybe capture mispricings. That's more or less how it's defined. So what are your thoughts on that? So, you know, Cliff Asnes at AQR has this um, expression of, he says about tactical, he says, it's okay to sin a little, meaning tactical is a sin, but it's okay to do it a little bit. And I sort of agree. And that is, I think that there are times where 
you can tilt your portfolio, you can lean into certain sectors. And, but I try to be very humble about the potential effectiveness of that. And so we, my firm, Hurdle Callahan, we do make uh, tactical decisions, but they're rare. And when I say rare, I mean once or twice a year. I don't think, I think the more frequent the trading, probably the lower threshold for conviction you have. In other words, wait for very high conviction. And also don't do it in a kind of size that can wipe you out. So for example, I'll give you an example. We've, we have been underweight duration in fixed income, meaning we have been underweight to the sativity of rates in our bond portfolios. We've had, you know, shorter maturities in our bond portfolios. And that's, you know, we've had that position for a year and a half or since the beginning of 21. So maybe 15 months. And we at with treasury rates backing up now to almost 3%, we've decided to take some of that off. So that was a that gives you a sense about the timing, you know, the the frequency of these uh what I think about tactical. Was that a fair uh answer to your question? Yeah, because you're not saying, for example, we're getting rid of all the fixed income. You're just saying we are adjusting, say, like you said, the duration and I don't know about the credit quality, you didn't bring that up, but we're adjusting in order to meet the current market conditions and do the best we can for our clients. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, exactly. And bearing in mind that you always, whenever we do a tactical move, we always think, what are the consequences if I'm wrong? Or in other words, what are the parts of my portfolio that will work if I'm wrong in this direction and how much will they work? So I think having a, a risk management sense, like an, you know, a, a planned loss and a planned return for a tactical trade is a really good practice. Not sure what stocks to buy and which to sell? Well, no worries. Market Beat has you covered. Get the latest buy and sell ratings from Wall Street's top performing, most accurate, and most respected research analysts. That's just one part of what you will receive as a Market Beat All Access subscriber. You'll also get Market Beat's new trending stock lists, which monitor social media chatter in real time to help you identify the next GameStop or AMC before you hear about it on the news. Market Beat All Access also features real time news, market events, and performance data for your stocks with the Market Beat portfolio monitoring tool. And you can take a completely risk free trial for just $1 if you head over to the link we will put in the show notes. You'll get best in class stock research tools performance ratings for Wall Street analysts, real-time news feed, executive support team access, all of this ad-free for just $1 for the first month. Sign up today. The link is in the show notes. I wanted to also get into strategic allocation and then maybe from that, what some of the specific sectors or asset classes that you are seeing strength right now. But let's just talk a little bit about your investment philosophy regarding broad asset allocation. That it's important to recognize the limits of asset allocation. And by that, I mean, you know, almost every financial asset is exposed to the economy. And so you can put different labels on things. You can label things REITs or defensive or consumer growth or so forth. But effectively, they're plays on the economy. And then you can label things fixed income and have, you know, high yield bonds and government bonds and mortgage-backed bonds, but they are effectively bets on interest rates. And so our strategic framework is have as much exposure to growth as you can. So in other words, if you know you're young and have, you know, high income prospects that might be 85, if you're closer to retirement that might be 60. So have as much exposure to growth as you can and be really cautious about diversification in terms of labels. So in other words, just because something is called a REIT 
and it owns real property, don't think that means you're buying a defensive asset. Because we, as we saw in the pandemic, REITs became, went from being a sort of defensive income asset to being at the center of the storm of the economy. That's one observation about strategic asset allocation. So because Wall Street likes to put labels on, you know, wrappers on products that make you think you're getting diversification, but it really it's just a repackaging of something you already have. Can I ask you to say a little bit more about that? Because I think that's a really interesting subject. And it sounds to me like consumers could even get ripped off by some of that. Well, you know, for example, there, you know, whatever trend is popular at the moment. So for example, energy transition or infrastructure or ESG, those are very popular themes and justifiably because people understand, appreciate that, you know, we are making a transition to, you know, a fossil, a a less intensive fossil free economy. They understand that, you know, the world needs more infrastructure to accomplish that. So, for example, in terms of the grid, in terms of the road and bridge infrastructure. So those are appealing concepts, but effectively they are exposed to economic growth, just like everything in your portfolio is already. So they have less diversification possibilities than you may think. Just because something's called an infrastructure equity, well, if you know traffic goes down on the bridge because fewer people have jobs and fewer people are commuting, guess what? You know, it's going to go down in a downturn. And I think that's something people, you know, are less aware of. And I think as you're saying that, something a light bulb went off here. I think for a lot of people who are traders or maybe long-term investors and prefer single stocks, I think a lot of times people are like, I don't know what I'm getting in that fund. I want more control over my own investments. Now, for right or wrong, because obviously you can make a lot of mistakes with that approach as well, as you and I have both seen, I'm sure. But that's an interesting thing. It goes to knowing what you own and I'm sorry, but I think the industry does not always necessarily make it that easy to do that. It seems that's what you're saying as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, with all due respect to Kathy Wood, an innovation fund might sound like a great theme, but if all it does is own electric vehicles and uh, genomics, then, and maybe alternative energy sources, that's a really concentrated bet. It's not innovation. Right. And has not worked out well now for more than a year. I just pulled up the chart as you were saying that. So, (laughs) Brad, let me ask you this, kind of since we're, I want to wrap up here, I'm very conscious of the time and I appreciate your, uh, your generosity in sharing your thoughts today. Tell us just some specific sectors, asset classes showing strength or weakness right now, because our listeners do really enjoy hearing about what areas of the market the professional investors may be looking at. So, yeah, it's clear that energy has been extremely strong this year and to a little bit lesser extent, commodities related producers. So, and we have exposure definitely to energy companies, both EMP and refining and marketing, and we have exposure to commodities producers. Those have worked very well. The thing I think it's important to bear in mind is that they are extremely sensitive to perceptions of economic growth and that if the Fed is hiking and if the Fed is perceived just to go a little bit too far and tip the economy over to recession, those can rapidly reprice. So I would say, you know, obviously you want to be exposed to energy and commodities, but I'd be cautious about betting too heavily in them. One thing that I think, you know, on the contrarian sense that is an opportunity emerging is in secular growth names that have been, uh, so this is, you know, software, medical devices, some of the payments names have been hurt on the thesis that interest rates going up damage the long-term cash flows more than the ones that are shorter term. 
And we don't think that's actually that argument holds water. And so the sell off in secular growth names, I think we are leaning our portfolios more into those. So that's those are names that, you know, are sometimes household names like Microsoft, Amazon, PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, and sometimes a little bit less known names like, you know, Intuitive Surgical and Thermo Fisher and Danaher that, you know, are long-term growth stories that have just been, I think, maybe unfairly treated in this pullback. And so at the margin, I would say be a little cautious on the things that have worked really well recently, which is energy, and maybe, you know, lean into the secular growth areas. I love the little bit of a contrarian angle you brought in there. Slightly contrarian, I think, but it's great. I really appreciate that. I'm sure the listeners will too, because it can give people some places maybe to begin building a watch list and waiting for that right moment. That's exactly what I'm doing right now is building the watch list. And I think being prepared with a list of names so that, you know, if we do get a real capitulation, that you've done the work and you can feel confident you knew you were going to buy, you know, Visa when it was down, you know, 25% year to date. And you can sort of be prepared to act. Hey, Brad, thank you so, so much for joining the show. This has been fascinating. I could talk to you for another hour, but I am cognizant of the time here. How can the listeners learn more about you and what you're doing at your firm if they want some more information? Sure. So Hurdle Callahan is an outsourced chief investment officer. Our clients are both high net worth families, as well as the philanthropic institutions they support. So endowments and foundations, and you can contact us on our website at www.hurdlecallahan.com. And I'm sure they can find that information in the call notes. Okay, great. Yes, we will absolutely link that up for you. All right, Brad, thanks very much. Really appreciate having you on the show today. Thanks again for listening to the Market Beat Podcast. Do not forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, anywhere else you get your podcasts. And you will also find us on marketbeat.com. If you enjoy the content here, please give us a five-star review so others can also find all the great interviews and market insights that we bring to you each week. Also, did you know that Market Beat has a YouTube channel? We sure do. The podcasts are there, as well as tips for getting the most out of Market Beat and becoming, as always, a better investor or trader. We'll be right back.